Hello, and welcome to another episode of Hacking with Friends. My name is Cody Kinsey. I am a security researcher with Veronis, and this is our primary cable plugger, Michael. <laughs> sure, at least you're uh, using that thesaurus and not calling me a gremlin all the time. Oh, of course not. No. Michael does a lot of things on the show. Aside from being the co-host, he also edits the show mm -hmm. and does a lot more than that. So Michael's very much a big part of the show. In fact, if you caught our last live stream, he's I'm also only the one partially responsible, partially for, responsible for our stream crashing <laughs> and leaving everyone hanging for six minutes. So uh, thank you to everyone who hung with us on that last stream. It got a little bit rough, but I'm glad we got to have some fun. I blame the internet. Yeah, so today we're going to be doing something that I think is pretty crazy and extreme. Um, we are going to be doing an OSINT investigation. Okay, nothing new there. But we're going to be going from just a photo and trying to get all mm -hmm. the way to some guy's passport number. Uh, and just to clarify, for people that may not be familiar with what OSINT is, it's open source, open source intelligence. intelligence. So okay. open source intelligence is a practice used by everything from large intelligence mm -hmm. agencies down to individual reporters and infosec and hackers uh, who want to be able to find as much information about an entity as possible. Mm -hmm. And this could be a business, it could be an individual, it could even be an event. And there's lots of OSINT investigations that you'll see maybe on mm -hmm. Twitter or other places that are done by really, really interesting organizations like Bellingcat that expose, for example, human rights violations and mm -hmm. other sorts of uh, really newsworthy events that don't get enough attention because they're really difficult to figure out where these things happened and who was involved. So investigators are able to use public sources like government databases, uh, websites that are maintained by third parties that kind of scrape this information and offer it in a really easy to digest format and other services to be able to collect enough information to solve these riddles mm -hmm. and then basically be able to bring in the right information to figure out what sort of uh, investigation they're currently working on. So, you know, this is really broad stuff. It could be anything from a hacker trying to profile a business mm -hmm. that they want to, hopefully they're a red teamer and they're allowed to do this, but it could be a hacker, you know, profiling their target and learning all the technical information as well mm -hmm. as the social information about the company. Or it could be somebody like a, you know, an OSIN investigator, um, maybe somebody looking to press charges against someone in like a criminal uh, investigation that's looking for all the public data they possibly possibly can find without actually needing to request a warrant, which is right. a big deal nowadays. Yeah, I know uh, for hackers at least, uh, and obviously, you know, hopefully red teamers, ethical hackers, you know, uh, doing that kind of deep research can be really helpful if you're trying to do a spear phishing attack, you know, maybe you, yeah, like you pretend, oh, hey, you know, I'm some government official, we have this information, we just need to clarify some stuff or whatever. Or then also the other side of that too is uh, doing deep research so you can make a uh, very specialized dictionary uh, password search list. So that way, if you're trying to brute force like a, a file that person encrypted, you have, you know, much better chance if you know the name of their dog and the name of their, their <laughs> the maiden name of their wife and all that stuff. It's more likely going to be something like that. Yeah, so these are all things that fall under the scope of OSINT. But today, we're going to be taking the role of that hacker where in a movie when the main character is like, all right, I got to picture the guy. Like, mm -hmm. you got to tell me who this is. And the hacker's like, got it, boss. And then comes back like five minutes later with all this information about the guy. Okay. Like, Their passport number is 57138. And it's like, how did you get that information? Well, today, we're actually going to do mm -hmm. that. Uh, assuming that the person that we're talking about has been sanctioned by the U.S. government. Now, there's lots of other ways that we might be able to find out this information, but today we're going to be stringing together resources that will allow us to go from a simple photo with no name attached, where we don't know who this guy is at all, all the way to this person's passport number and specific details of why they have been um, sanctioned by the U.S. government. So, so, in theory, like, this could be, like, a photo that we found on social media of, like, a protest, or, like, it could be, it like, could be a, a sneaky... picture you took. Yeah, yeah, or, like, a, a sneaky photo you took outside of a business that you're red teaming or something like that. Right, and before we start out with this, I have to uh, point out a couple things. These resources are evolving. They are free, they are open, and they are not going away. So while some of the things we're going to show today might be a little controversial for the privacy implications, for example, mm -hmm. there are real uh, facial recognition recognition searches out there that really do turn up, you know, matches of people. And it's not really ethical to go around just taking pictures of people and then running them through the search. Right. Although 
you know, it, it is important to be aware that it is possible. Mm -hmm. So if you take anything away from today, it should be that these services are rapidly becoming a thing. And if you want to control your privacy, you might need to go on some of these and maybe request some photos be taken down or removed because they do respond to these requests. So during the course of our investigation, we are going to be using a photo that could basically be from anywhere. Of course, this is going to be a photo that I found on the internet, but the same process would theoretically work if you were an investigator and you happen to snap a picture of someone who uh, you saw maybe committing a crime. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, if it was a really big crime and you were an investigator, let's say maybe a journalist or somebody else trying to piece together like who this person is, then you might be able to string together these resources and actually come up with a large amount of information in a relatively short period of time. Cool. So the tools we're going to be using today are a couple of web-based tools. And again, when you're uploading anything to a third party, you should be aware that that third party doesn't need to tell you what they're doing with it necessarily. So all the tools we're using today are free except for Maltego. And Maltego has explicit privacy policies about like how they process information and like what goes out and stuff like that. You can read it. It's very, very clear. Some of these other services, oh, well, and I'll also say I know the people at Maltego and they have a vested interest in the trust of the people mm -hmm. who you know they work with. And they primarily work with the investigator community. These other tools, like specifically the web-based tools we're going to be using today, they don't really answer to anyone. Yeah. And it's not entirely certain what they're doing with the faces uh, and uh, pictures that you're uploading. So be aware that when you're uploading stuff, you should, especially if it's photos of yourself, mm -hmm. only upload photos that are already publicly available on the internet. And I cannot stress this enough. It is already enough of a privacy nightmare that these things exist in the first place, mm -hmm. let alone feeding them images of yourself to see what else turns up. So don't get into the trap of just like feeding in a bunch of new faces just to see if something comes out. That is how these things gather new faces. So for now, if you want to see, for example, if you are on this service, then only pick an image to upload that is publicly available on the internet somewhere. Because then at that point, it's probably already crawled it and you won't be feeding it new stuff. I personally find this stuff very creepy, but I also find it super useful during my investigations. So, you know, for OSINT investigators and other people looking to mm -hmm. do something like this, they should be aware that it is possible. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, obviously, like, there's all the privacy implications, right? But, like, just because you don't like it or, or, or you find it unethical doesn't mean people aren't going to take advantage of it and use it. So if you just turn your blinders to it, uh, then you know, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot, I feel like. Yep. All right, so we're basically going to be using three tools chained together mm -hmm. in order to get someone's identity today. And again, we're assuming this is for a criminal investigation. If you do this against like a romantic partner or someone who you're about to go on a date with or whatever, you're kind of creepy and they mm -hmm. might get mad at you and they would probably be legitimate to feel yeah. like you had invaded their privacy. So don't go using this for uh, something where you might get in a uh, yeah, get in trouble. Right. Just because you can do it doesn't mean it's ethical. Yeah, so we talk a lot about ethical hacking, and one thing is not abusing other people's trust. We use these tools because they allow us to do really powerful things, but they can also enable abusers and other people who are sketchy to do things that are not ethical. So be aware that you know you need to use these tools responsibly, and uh, if you don't, then you're a real creepy guy or gal. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Onto okay. your screen? Onto our screen. So let's say that we're starting out this investigation, and currently we have an image. Maybe this is something we snapped ourselves. And this is someone who uh, is either a very high level person at this company, mm -hmm. um, or uh, if we're a hacker or red teamer who is going to be using yeah. this for like an OSINT thing, uh, where we're going to do, as you said, like a spear phishing attack. Or uh, if we're a journalist, maybe this is someone who was photographed mm -hmm. in the commission of a crime or something. And the police like haven't released any information yet, but we want to know who this is. Are they connected to a bigger story? Is it someone who's important? How would we figure out who this is? So a lot of people are already going to know who this is as soon as I open it up because this was a pretty big news story a while ago. But not everybody is involved in international news, mm -hmm. so maybe some people won't. So this is the picture we're going to be taking today. Um, we don't know who this is. It's just some guy who's dressed kind of nicely. You know, you can kind of make some inferences about like where this might be from. But starting from this image, is it at all possible for us to figure out who this is? And from that, can we figure out if there is a bigger story? Like, for example, is this person being yeah. sanctioned by uh, the United States of America? And is their passport number publicly available? 
um, that yeah. as a journalist might allow us to access other records. For example, if we had access to mm -hmm. maybe travel records or some other stuff that's been leaked or made public, right. we might be able to, if we, for example, find out that there was a large leak around a particular case, go through and look for examples of this passport mm -hmm. number and find instances of this person mm -hmm. where we wouldn't be able to search through that data otherwise. So frequently for journalists or investigators, getting the first clue and then stringing together more and more will allow us to utilize more and more OSINT resources. For example, once we get something like an email address, we might also be able to infer something like a screen name as well, mm -hmm. which would allow us to search the web for other web uh, like profiles or pages about that person and learn more and more information about them. Mm -hmm. That kind of when you when you kind of break to the next level of clues, like that's a really big deal in OSINT because it allows you to start from a really small piece of data and maybe right. there's only one clue in the entire case and be able to pull in a whole bunch more. So yeah, cuz like what I often find is like if you have a picture or something then you're able to find like a Facebook profile or some social media and that'll give you like an idea of a username and then usually their email is like that username or, or some variation of their name like that. And then that's like you said, down the rabbit hole, you can go from there. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you get lucky and you can have a one-to-one -one match. Now, if you have a photo that's just mm -hmm. off the internet, a lot of people will just run it through a Google image search and, and just try to find out like, yeah. okay, has somebody else uploaded this exact image before? But there can be some things like just cropping it, for example, that can make that not work. I was gonna say, yeah. First thing I always try is Google reverse image search, but like it's less than optimal because I, I believe they've uh, intentionally implemented it so that it can't be used like that. Like for this sort of thing, it would return like man and then give you like tons of other pictures of guys. Exactly, yeah, so uh, in a previous example, I took, uh, I took this image and um, there was another one of the same man that had a cowboy hat and I ran it through Google reverse image search and it just said cowboy hat and then it like patted itself on the back like great job me. Yeah. I was like that's no. Oh and it'll give you like two photos too and it's like thanks Google. Yeah so um, searching. let's see do I have I have a, um, a browser extension oh I think it's for Firefox that's uh, just like who stole my photos. And you can just take it and you can um, search it directly. Oh, cool. But here you can you see there's if... just like search Google for image. I think it's literally who stole my photos. Okay, yeah, I was going to say, is it like a pixel for pixel? Like it has to be the exact all right, same guys, size. We can all go home. We crack it. We crack the case. Gentleman. This is a gentleman. Okay. So like Google is stupid um, at this sort of thing. And it is not actually doing facial recognition. It's doing matching. And of course, this photo actually does exist on Google but the algorithm is not smart enough to match it to a cropped photo. So because I cropped this in, we are now officially stumped. We don't know who this guy is. Um, and let's say that our other tools aren't working either. Mine is we've, welcome up now. Yeah, we've got a gentleman. Uh, yep. That's all we know, bringing all the gentlemen for, for, <laughs> for questioning. So this looks like a dead end, but it's not necessarily because there's also other tools we can use that are super mega creepy. So let's go, go on over to PimEyes, which is a weird, creepy name for a the website. The most advanced facial recognition search. Yep, and aside from um, searching eyeless hipsters, it also allows <laughs> us to search web uh, pictures we take. And this is the website that I do not recommend you upload any photos that are not already public to, because yeah. I don't know a lot about this website. I don't know who's controlling it, what they're doing with it. They're almost surely using every photo that's uploaded to improve their facial recognition, mm -hmm. recognition algorithm. So just be aware, this is a big data website that's offering up big data and collecting it So I should just upload every private image I have on my phone. Oh boy. Um, that's oh, what I'm hearing. Oh boy. All right, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and use this example we have. I have a couple others of the same person, but we're gonna start with just this one. Who are you? And once it opens, we should have a couple matches with confidence attached to it. So basically like how sure we are that this is a match. So first we have the original image, go us, nice. that's great. Uh, and that's really cool, but unfortunately we're not trying to just reverse the original image, we're also trying to find new ones that might be easier to track down. Now when you look at this sort of stuff, you can see that there is some uh, variation between like uh, the websites that it's from, but they're obscured. You have to mm -hmm. click here to unlock, and guess what? Do you guys know anything about capitalism, how that works? Like how, how like things are provided? Guess what's gonna happen when I yeah. click on unlock? It's gonna ask for tons of money. It's gonna give me a gift card. Let's see who's right. Oh, it's asking for money. Michael's yeah. right. I guess I've learned nothing. All right, well, um, I don't wanna do that. So let's, uh, let's hack, guys. Are you ready? Are you ready to hack? So if I right mouse click, 
inspect. I don't know if you guys knew this one. Boop. Okay, so <gasps> now we can see the website that this comes from. Um, we can also see a terrifying... Um, I didn't even know that it, it does, did this weird thumbnail. I wonder if that's where um, the b bounding box for the facial recognition. It probably is. Um, but basically right here we have the source. The um, But it is cropped. So we can see like in general what the website is. But if we were trying to navigate to this, then it wouldn't actually go anywhere. For example, if I just go here and I try to do this, I, it's going to error out and say 404. I do um, wonder... Um, it does, in Pim Eyes, when you inspect, it shows you uh, the image itself, right? That it's displaying, like the full non-cropped image? Yes. I bet you could just use Google Image Search with that image and the website and find it. You probably could. So Michael made a good point. So one problem is if you were to just take a picture, like a screenshot of this, for one, it like does this like stuff over mm -hmm. it to make it harder for you to search it. And you'll notice it also puts a black... Um, like a little black thing on the bottom. Yeah. So as soon as you interact with it, it instantly tries to make it harder for you to reverse image search that image, yeah. which I think is very silly and also lame. Um, but I mean, you know, they're trying to make some money. So, you know, we could, as a hacker, just inspect our way to, to you know, the source image here and just try to find like where there's something. I'm sure just by clicking and opening, we would eventually come up on something. But really, yeah. like, I don't care so much about this. Like, uh, yeah. uh, we can, because we can take the next step if we really need to in uh, locating an image by just going through and finding something that's a bit more recognizable. Um, so, yeah, there's there's a lot of, that we can really do here. And I think, yeah, I, I just, uh, I'm fascinated mm -hmm. by... Um, can you make your screen full screen? Oh, yeah, I can. But it makes yeah. the images smaller. Yeah. Because and logic... I can, yeah, yeah. So this website scales stuff weirdly, but if you really want to go in and try to like snap a, another picture, you can just make it really, really big. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so basically, like we're able to get a lot of pictures here that give us much more context. So we can see like this is a politician. We can see the early like cowboy hats. This is the one that yield uh, yielded the cowboy hats one. Um, and you can also see there's some ones that are split. So you know, if I wanted to just take one of these and search it. This is where there's mm -hmm. enough variety here that we could probably take one of these images and get a name. Yeah. So um, as Michael was saying, uh, we could probably just take, I think maybe something like this. And since this is much more clear and we can see that it's been cropped in various ways, mm -hmm. if I just take this image, let's go ahead and do a Google image search again and see if we get anything better than a uh, gentleman. I kind of suspect that that's just going to give you, like, some version of Gentleman again. Because, like, I know the only time I've had good results with Google Image Search is, like, when it's a, a pixel for pixel match. Like, it's not cropped, it's nothing's done to it, and then you'll find, like, the news article it was in or something like that. Let's see. So, I do have a solution here. Um, wow, it's uploading for a long time. Um, I do have a solution here, even if this doesn't work. So, I'm kind of, um, let's see no other matches so uh no. but we have another clue michael business person. this isn't just a gentleman he's also a business okay a that's business all we got to do make a venn diagram of the gentlemen yep. that are also businessmen mm -hmm. and then we bring, bring them in, in on a lineup yeah and then we just look at all of them and find the right the one. case is cracked everyone yeah <sighs> we're done, done. but if we have to do this mm -hmm. then there is a way all right so you guys have heard of Pim Eyes, but have you heard of Tin Eye? <laughs> Very different, everyone. Very different. Yeah. Uh, isn't there a couple others like this, too? Oh, I just knows. don't remember there's, the names. There's a lot. Yeah. Uh, okay, so here... Google search facial recognition. Reverse after. image search. Um, find where the image is else is online. So this has a much better algorithm. So let's go ahead and take this. See if we can upload it. And this does things like partial matches much better. Here we go. We found it. So cool. Tinai is much less stupid than Google reverse image search for finding mangled, slightly changed, cropped, and or otherwise. Uh, huh? I see URLs that don't yes. have paywalls in front of them. Yes, yes, yes. So not only is it better at dealing with mangled or distorted or otherwise uh, modified photos, um, AKA cropped images from Pim Eyes. Mm -hmm. um, it also allows you full access. So let's say we want to go ahead and click on this. Um, we now have the option to also tra translate this into English. 
I now know that I do not want to subscribe. And if I scroll down, I can see the name of this gentleman. Roberto Sandoval, and I'm not going to pronounce his last name because I'll mess it up, but I feel good about that. Roberto Sandoval. Okay, so we also can see who he is, the governor of this state in Mexico. So if we want to begin our investigation now, we've taken basically just a photo, which mm -hmm. again, we could have taken on like an airplane or something. Right. Like this guy's talking about drug dealing and being a, a huge narco yeah. trafficker in my first class seat behind me that I or, got or randomly like, upgraded to. I wonder who yeah. he is. Um, you could actually probably find out, mm -hmm. um, although he might not be flying considering his past. I was going to say in like terms of like investigative journalism, oh. it'd be more likely like, there's this guy meeting with these top level CEOs. I wonder who that is or, or something like that. Or some such thing. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, we got to get back to, you know, our buddy who has sent us this random photo who's asking who this gentleman is. So we got to really impress them. And now that we know the name of this person, we can start doing a more broad investigation and we're going to use Maltego. So for those who are not aware, Maltego is an investigative tool that is really popular among hackers, investigators, and reporters. <clears throat> And it has a free version, so you're welcome to go ahead and try out a lot of the stuff. Um, some of the things I'm going to be working with today are either really new or in the paid version that I'm mm -hmm. kind of helping to test. But I want to show some of the really powerful things you can do using some of these modules and plugins that allow investigators mm -hmm. to very quickly be able to drill down on a piece of information. Yeah. So some of this is also new to me, so I'm kind of also practicing what I've just learned. But um, there's a really cool module in Malteco uh, that uh, allows access to Aleph, which is a resource that is open source and used by reporters mm -hmm. all over the world to combine information. And some of this is stuff like the Panama Papers. So if you need to do like a really, really big search through a mm -hmm. huge data set, they strategically add different data sets that are really, really uh, interesting and useful for reporters, investigators, and, and anybody that's using the tool and make it available uh, in this case, as a transform through Maltego. Right. And there's also a web interface you can use that is, as far as I know, free, um, that you can continually do these searches on. It's yeah. just that it's really difficult to keep... Tedious. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's really difficult and tedious to keep track of multiple data points and how they relate to each other mm -hmm. when you're just working with a web interface. The Maltego interface is a really good way to pull in data and show right. how it's kind of uh, represented. Yeah, I think the main selling point of Maltego really in my mind is just the way it allows you to visualize how data is connected and easily expand data um, through simple transforms and stuff. Yes. Um, and if you are a credentialed uh, journalist, uh, I hear that you can contact Maltego directly and you may or may not get a discount. Yeah, so if you are press or if you know someone who's press, definitely let them know about this because Maltego is really, really friendly to uh, press people. If you are working uh, basically anywhere you're doing investigations and you, and you have a good use case, they're mm -hmm. always willing to go like for you guys like a demo license uh, and you know keep it rolling for as long as it makes sense or negotiate a favorable price for your newsroom or whatever else you're working with. So um, they've been really friendly towards me and all the journalists that I've trained to use it. So if you are a journalist or someone who works adjacent to one, it might be worth it to reach out and say hello. So, all right, we are going to go ahead and open up a new, ooh, I love the noises. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna open yeah. up a new graph. Spooky and, like alien UFO noises. Yeah, so uh, this gives us access to our entity palette and you can see this is serious business when the default entities are like domain, email address, mm -hmm. URL, and then it kicks up to cryptocurrency owner. And then we scroll way down and it's just like uh, getting really heavy, like specific websites, a mugshot. Um, hmm. an instructables group. Uh, so there's like there was one that was like a terrorist. Um, so they they nice. really prepared for a, a prison. Um, entities are basically data points, and okay. when we are looking through huge sets of data, Maltego recognizes these points of data and represents them as entities. And these entities uh, are really easy to keep track of because they have different icons and they're processed in different ways. So it provides both standardization of data that you're pulling in. So a person's name will be represented by like the same icon every time. And you'll be able to search um, using the available tools to you know, take a name and learn more information the same way every time you pull in a name. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll do a demonstration. But I just love that, yeah, oh yeah, a terrorist, a terrorist leader, an unknown suspect. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I believe Malteco is uh, very commonly used by intelligence agencies mm -hmm. and the like. Yep. So this is like an incredibly powerful tool. Yes, it is. So we're going to go ahead and start with the most generic 
thing, um, mm -hmm. which is a phrase. And a phrase can be anything. And this is something we can use basically as a placeholder if we don't know what kind of entity mm -hmm. it's going to be yet. And in this case, we know that it's a person, but let's go ahead and start with just a name. So I'm gonna just literally copy and paste it. Yeah, because this could be like a pseudonym that we found or a username perhaps. Okay, and when I right mouse click on it, I can see that we have lots and lots of different transforms we can run on it. Now, what Multigo is really doing is it's providing you the ability to take any data point and pivot off of it. Mm -hmm. And using a series of transforms, which are called, which are basically a combination of like an algorithm to organize data and an API call to bring in new data from an external data source. You're able to take a single point of data and turn it into potentially many, many different leads that can allow you to take the next step further in your mm -hmm. investigation. Now, it's important to note the data sources because some of these might be primary source data, meaning it's actually a piece of data from the original source that you can trust. And some of these might be secondary sources of data where you actually need to go and make sure the original yeah. source it's referring to is real. Otherwise, somebody might have misreported something. There could be an error in the data. It's, it's kind right. of a, an imperative to make sure that the data you're being given is uh, in some way referenceable so that you can make sure that it's real. But in the case of most of our investigations, we're gonna be basically pulling down as much data as we can and then getting rid of everything that's irrelevant to our investigation. Because frequently there could be like a false match, something with the same name or something else that's obviously not related to what we're looking for. Right. So in this case, when we right mouse click, we can see there's a lot of transforms available. And so not all of these transforms would be included in the community edition, correct? Right, so Multigo now includes a lot of transforms um, by default in the standard transforms packs. So mm -hmm. this is, if we go to all transforms within it, you can see there's still a lot of stuff we can do with a name mm -hmm. um, just within the standard, uh, in, like included by everything. In fact, let's see if we can run it and see if yeah. it does anything. I was gonna say also, uh, so there's a variety of types of transforms, like there's the free transforms and then I think there's like special paid transforms that certain other third party companies might make. And then I believe you can also create your own transforms and if you're interested in that, stay tuned because I think we're going to be doing an upcoming live stream on that and looking at how you can take like an API or some other data source and implement that into Malteco uh, to use for your investigations. Okay, so <clears throat> when we run that search, we get a variety of different entities back and some of these are PDF files. US so, Navy hosting? Yeah, so we can see, US, for some reason, when we search this guy's name, we find a PDF file that says the US Navy's hosting something. So we can just literally take this. Um, and then Control F. And it looks like this is not a good match. It just found both strings of text in here somewhere. Gotcha. So we can delete this. And to get rid of something that's not a good match, we can just right mouse click and press the X. Yeah. Gone. So again, this is maybe not the best match. Yeah. I don't think we're going to find this guy on LinkedIn, um, but we might be able to find some more information on some re more mm -hmm. relevant looking stuff. Um, like we know he was accused of corruption. Yeah, I was going to uh, say, Malteco is generally pretty good, but I do think you'd need to go through and polish your data most of the time. Yeah, you always have to um, check. So this is a CSV. What's in here? I don't know. It downloaded my computer and I'm immediately going to go ahead and delete it. Downloading random CSVs is always recommended. Thanks but no thanks and goodbye. Okay, so um, don't want that, but still an interesting data point. So as you can see, this is like, yeah. while this is interesting, there might be a better module for us to learn about this person. So this is kind of a bit more than I wanna weed through. I'm just gonna select everything and I'm just gonna get rid of it and try a different module instead. And again, this is one of the newer ones and you can always run um, these uh, Aleph searches on the website as well, if you want to. And we'll see that shortly too. So let's go ahead and switch over to a different transform set. And in this case, we're going to be using um, this one, Aleph. Mm -hmm. Click on this. Then there's a lot of transform here. You can see lookup in all Aleph data, lookup yeah. in specific data sets. So um, one thing I can immediately do is if I suspect that this is like a big deal kind of guy who might be mm -hmm. you know, involved in something that would land him on a person's of, person of interest list, this involves everything from like a red notice from Interpol um, to, you know, like, I guess like corruption notices from the United States where they decide to make some sort of official sanction against someone. A, the, a person of interest basically means someone who's been designated by a police agency or a government mm -hmm. as someone who's suspected of being involved in a major crime or some sort of other 
that yeah. stuff. Uh, well, something else I was going to say a moment ago is I think this also highlights the importance of if you are doing an OSINT investigation on someone relatively high profile, it's important to have like a secure computer and be using like VPNs and Tor and at a minimum like using uh, incognito tabs or otherwise not being logged in to like LinkedIn because you don't want the person saying, oh, why is this random investigative journalist looking at my LinkedIn profile, right? Yes, like, I, I really hope that um, if you are a journalist or an investigator, you're not going to people's LinkedIn pages while you're signed in. Um, we can do a whole other section on like privacy and security settings like for investigators, but obviously make sure, yes, you're taking basic privacy mm -hmm. um, and security uh, considerations before you start to do any of this. One yeah. thing in particular is make sure you know where your searches are going. While Montego is a great service, there are mm -hmm. API calls that go out of it to whatever data source you're using. So some transforms act kind of as a middleman, um, not all of them, uh, but there is one I know in particular, social links, that will basically do searches on your behalf through some of these other mm -hmm. parties. So they're basically taking your search result, digesting it, and sending it out to somewhere else, and then bringing it back very convenient, but they're also re possibly retaining your searches. Yeah. And that could be a big deal if you don't want like a Russian company that you don't really know processing your data about mm -hmm. a sensitive investigation, maybe about Russia. Yeah. So, you know, it's it just is important for you to know where your data is going and make sure that you have these bases covered. We can't do the whole stream on that right now because it's, it's a really big topic. But mm -hmm. yes, like if you begin an investigation and you start poking around and you don't bother to cover your identity, right. you could very well let your target know that you're investigating them, especially if you're not covering your IP address or you're signed into a bunch of your personal social media mm -hmm. accounts while you're doing these investigations. Yeah, uh, yeah. if y'all are interested in that, let us know and we can do a future life. Like that's definitely an hour on its own. Yep, all right, so right now we're gonna do a person of interest search, which sounds intense and like it should just be for the police, that's but the it's not. That's the name of the TV so, show too. <laughs> yeah, so we're gonna run. Um, and let's see what we get uh, as far as a person of interest. And again, we're just using a phrase for this. So if we're not completely mm -hmm. sure of someone's uh, name, then we can double check it here. So uh, we have a couple different hits. We have people here um, on the USOFAC sanctions list. What is the USOFAC? Um, Google could tell you. The US Office of Foreign Asset Control. The only reason you know that is because you just... Okay, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> um, but here, anyway, we can see that we also have a bunch of what looks like documents. So we can double click here mm -hmm. and go to properties and see exactly what this is. And it looks like we've located a PDF. So if we want to see more about this, we can scroll down. We can see that there's the uh, web URL to this piece of information on Aleph, which again is a third-party source right. of data. So we have to check it out before we just trust it. So let's go to the domain that we found here. And as you were saying before, Aleph is like something most investigative journalists would already know about. Yes. Um, free and available. However, it can be a little uh, cumbersome or tedious to look through and, and really figure out how all the information is connected. Okay, so I'm not seeing any Roberto here, but this is the document that allegedly has um, some sort of tie back to it. So we can see that um, uh, this comes from a data set of uh, persons of interest in Mexico or South America. So that, I mean, that sounds legitimate. Mm -hmm. um, and we can see there's 40 countries included, 338 emails. Wow. Um, wow, there is a lot here. So yeah, we can search this data set, see if there's anything else relevant. Mm -hmm. I mean, it looks like we found like one of the sources well, where we can probably find more information I, about him. I was gonna say, literally when we started the search, it could have been one of, what, like seven billion people in the world. Oh, okay, half that since we know he's male or whatever, but still, like, even getting that narrowed down to like 300 something emails is a tremendous leap just yeah. in a couple minutes. Well, yeah, um, so we have Pablo Roberto Sandoval, we have Roberto Sandoval, and then we have Carlos Roberto, oh my gosh, this name is long. Um, Carlos Roberto Isaiah Garcia Sandoval. I don't, wow. So this is an Interpol red notice. Um, this is uh, from the sanctions list. And you can see we're getting multiple names off this one. Mm -hmm. um, so there might, there, there's a couple of things that could be going on. There could be multiple people with very similar names mm -hmm. or these different um, data sets could be referring to different people. So here I can also see 
that uh, I can identify this person's date of birth, 1986. Um, and I can also see their place of birth. Yeah, so you could try to compare those. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Data. So if I go over here, if I go to properties, and let's see, oh, I don't have a birth date, mm. but do I have a place of birth? Place of birth. All right, so I'll have to compare that. I get Mexico. Uh, yeah, because the last thing you different. want. Is a it's a case of mistaken identity. Yeah, so it looks like it's different. So this this person may not be our subject, whereas I these think ones those two are very well made. So yep, yeah, this one the place of birth matches, and we have a completely dif different date of birth. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking this is our guy. So is there a way to combine those entities? Since we know that there's the same person and they're both person entities. Uh, I don't know. Okay. But first, before we do that, I'm going to go ahead and verify that this is the person we're talking about by checking the link here. We can even see that we've got their passport number. So Ooh. this is a general profile of this person um, that allows us to oh yeah, uh, see all the other mentions in the database. So okay. here, if I want to get that same result, and I'm like, damn, I want that passport number. That looks great. I can right mouse click. And since we have a different, uh, basically, we have a, a different type of entity here. Um, instead of this being just, you know, a phrase, this allows us to do more specific transforms and look for this in a better way than we were doing before. So I'm going to go ahead and in the uh, Aleph transforms, I'm going to look for all relationships. And this will look for any relationship to data that has this individual in it. And hopefully we can pull down some more data um, such as the passport number, because I really want to be able to just get this in Multigo without having to go yeah. through the web interface. And there we go. So now we have his passport. Ta-da! And we can see that he's on the sanctions block list as well. You can see the authority who issued the specific order. It's the U.S. Office of Foreign Asset Control. So that's how I know it. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can see that this is the Global uh, Magnitsky Act, which that means that this person did something very, very and bad. And I imagine you could look that act up and find that. Oh yeah. So if you do, you, do you know what that is? No. So the this act is uh, to basically punish people or punish like governments that are doing uh, things that are very corrupt or bad. Um, okay. It's by the United States Department of State, and it's been used to go after major violators of human rights. Um, so. This is a big deal. If you're on this, then you've done some messed up stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. And you're probably like a very rich Russian person, <laughs> but also potentially a very corrupt um, Mexican politician, apparently. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So basically, this is how we can get from a point. Basically, we just took a photo that we couldn't mm -hmm. find any matches on the Internet. We managed to identify the through facial recognition, other photos we were able to achieve a match. And then we used another matcher to bring us full circle back to this person's passports. And here you can see if you go to the properties, you have the source who provided this passport number. You have the passport number itself. And you know, if you wanted to run more searches on this, it's like, all right, where yeah. else is this passport? I was going to say, I think that would be a valuable piece of information to extrapolate. Yeah. So here. Um, you can just run all transforms, but I like to do one, uh, let's see, what was it? Get all relationships. Okay. And, and when you're doing these transforms, it's like taking in like the kind of entity it is and all the information included, or is it just like straight up, like just searching that number on Google? No, it, in this case, it's searching through a specific data set. So okay. it's searching through Aleph. It's not searching through Google, which means that there's um, much less need to sanitize the data mm -hmm. because a lot of this stuff is coming from a single source that's more or less curated itself. Now, I'm not really sure if we're going to get much by start running all transforms on this, but hey, let's see if anything 30 comes 30 seconds up. later, there's like 50 entities that pop up. Oh, yeah, it, it happens a lot. Um, boop. Oh, we did find something. A country. I think you... Uh, wow. Thank you, Mal Maltego for the that. Case. Valuable yeah, and then it's and some of this is just referring back. So what's what's nice about this is every one of these arrows is an entity that otherwise would be cluttering up the graph, but it's recognized that hey, this password belongs to this guy, uh, and two different data sources have now confirmed this. So while this could be perceived as like annoying to have like a data mm -hmm. to these data sets pointing to each other, they're basically confirming each other, and that's something that I like about this. Um, it yeah. allows us to take a single port a source of data and be like, oh, OK, like this is confirmed by three other sources mm -hmm. of data from three separate entities that are all pointing back at this. Yeah. And again, you can go ahead and follow up on any of these through Aleph. I think that um, 
now that I, I, I haven't really been too um, active using this before, but I find that it is really cool how mm -hmm. easy it is to get started, um, you know, just learning all this stuff. But again, it looks like it's um, some sources are hidden from anonymous users. Well, then I'm going to access it through Maltego. Uh, yeah. it, it really wants me to, um, but I'm just going to use Maltego because I, I want to. So, so Maltego lets you see that even when you're anonymous. Yeah. Oh, hey, this is interesting. So, okay. So one thing, one taking a quick step outside of Maltego, we can see that there are some data sets that are related to our good friend Roberto, such as the Panama Companies Registry. Uh -huh. um, that's not good. So like Panama, the Panama Papers leaks um, showed mm -hmm. a lot of shell companies and other like sketchy businesses that were hiding money from taxes and basically doing stuff like money laundering. So being able to find, uh, for example, Florida land property, <laughs> Uh, databases that contain this person's name. I mean, yeah. we do need to make sure we're not getting any um, false matches, yeah. but LF has already done some of that for us by matching things like biographic information and making sure, for example, that these people at least seem to have like the same uh, birth date and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so we can also see that there is a WikiLeaks document. Um, this is from the US Department of State, and we can see that there's a cable that apparently mentions this guy. So that's interesting. Yeah. So if we had any interest in knowing what the US Department of State was saying about, uh, see if I can find it. That might be more in his governmental capacity. Oops. Yeah. Well, but also if they knew he was prep. Uh, while Roberto Sandoval is likely no angel, his arbitrary and illegal arrest has many in secret quite concerned. Mentioned blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so basically we yeah. can just see what um, the U.S. Department of State thought about the whole situation as it developed. So if you're a reporter who, you know, has now realized that the person you were sitting next to in first class or that your source sent you a yeah. picture of is actually like a major drug pen that's on the run or something or, or corrupt yeah. official on the run, then, uh, you know, being able to see the context behind this could add a lot to the story mm -hmm. or lead you to the next clue. And I don't think we're going to go uh, any further than leaks um, cables from uh, okay. the United States Department of State. I think that that's as far as this investigation yeah. needs to go. But going from someone's face to, you know, leaked conversations diplomats are having about you um, is, a, is a pretty yeah. interesting tool to and, be able and to have. And being able to yes. do that in like a handful of minutes with what, like, I guess like two or three searches mm -hmm. is... Uh, pretty uh, spooky when you think about it, actually. Yep, so something I would probably try to do then is actually go through... Should I go back to your screen? Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Uh, we're fine. I, I would basically go back and try to start tying all this stuff together in Multigo mm -hmm. and create a graph that's easier to do a report on for like an intelligence analyst right. and it's kind of having all these like screenshots of stuff. Once I know where the data is, I can generally mm -hmm. find it in Multigo, import it, and have it all together. And of course, you can also, using Multigo, do things like have your own local transforms or bring your own data sets in certain instances. So yeah. it's a really flexible tool that I like a lot for um, just organizing your thoughts during an investigation. And you can mm -hmm. always manually add um, all this stuff as well just to keep track of it as you go along. So. Right. For visualizing this stuff in potentially a very complex investigation, I find it to be a great tool. Um, and again, the free version is available for anyone who wants to check it out. Um, but also the other tools you mentioned today, PIM Eyes and Tin Eye, um, yeah. are also really useful for investigations that are based on a single photo or something that otherwise might be really hard to track down. These tools have evolved a lot and they are creepy. So make mm -hmm. sure if you're using them, you're only using them for an investigation uh, or in some other ethical way. Uh, make sure that you're also not uploading photos of yourself or other people that don't already exist on the internet. It is rude. And you're basically teaching this creepy service that's not accountable to anyone mm -hmm. how to recognize photos even better and feeding those pictures into the system. So just just don't do it. Um, it's like, it, it's, it's just creepy. <laughs> it's just creepy. Yeah. But um, hopefully you guys have gotten a taste for how powerful OSINT is. It's a really amazing tool for investigators, hackers, or anybody else that needs to learn about, well, pretty much anything, mm -hmm. because the data out there exists. And the tools exist to get to the right piece of data you're looking for. You just have to know your question really well, and then the tools you have at your disposal to get there. So yeah, if you guys want to check out uh, more OSINT tools, make sure to let us know in the comments. Mm -hmm. We are here answering questions. And also, you can hit me up on Twitter at Cody Kinsey if you have other OSINT ideas for us. I'd love to cover more OSINT stuff on the show, and I think we're going to be doing a lot of OSINT OSINT stuff over the next month or so. So if you have ideas for tools you want to see covered, please let us know uh, because we would love to hear from you. Yep. Uh, yeah, I think that's everything we have for today, right? Yep. That's cool. Everything.
So if you guys like the show, make sure to check out the Security Forward, that's Security FWD channel. All of these are recorded and saved there, so you can watch mm -hmm. this as well as other great ones. We have two other uh, ones on OSINT. One of them on Trucker OSINT, which I'm honestly shocked is not <laughs> popular. Yeah. Uh, you guys don't want to like track down trucking logistic problems? Like, all right, fine. Uh, and then, well, as some of my other favorite channels always say, sure, I'm showing you how to do this particular thing, but it's also more about the process. So learning the process, mm -hmm. you know, sure, like I now know how to look up this one guy's passport number, but knowing the process of how, I, how to look up anyone's passport number, much more important. Yep. And also, um, if you want to check out our other one, it was on, I believe, just OSINT using government databases, as well as a little bit of Multego. And we took a look at the Theranos mm -hmm. investigation, where we looked at all the online assets of this fraudulent company, managed to figure out where they were registering their businesses and all the different deals they had, and then found out about all the tons and tons and tons of lawsuits they are now buried under. Yes. Super fun. And also, if you want to uh, see other general security content, Veronis has a lot of other great stuff. Mm -hmm. You can check out the AD PowerShell course, which is a great way to get started working with Active Directory and PowerShell. And of course, you can always catch out some of the great webinars we have on things like ransomware, if you're interested in that too. Awesome. Yeah. All right. That's all we have for today. Thank you guys for hanging with us. If you have any questions, make sure to save them up for our Q&A or drop them in the YouTube comments where we'll mm -hmm. answer them live on the Q&A, which it's not next week, but the week after. Uh, they're every other Wednesday. Every other Wednesday. So and... if you're watching this right now, then it's going to be next, not next Wednesday, Wednesday after. Yes. All right. We'll see you guys <laughs> next time. I get confused. Bye. Bye.